Um, so as Jamie just said, um, my name is Michelle, and I work with NSU Works, which is our institutional repository, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Can I see a show of hands of how many of you know what an institutional repository is already? You've learned? OK. Do, you, do any of you have them at your institutions? OK. <laughs> just double checking before I start talking about them. Uh, so, uh, in this presentation, uh, which I'm going to make short, hopefully, so you guys can get out of here early, um, I'm going to talk about institutional repositories. I'm going to talk about NSU Works uh, specifically. I'll give you a little bit of background on what we're doing with it. I'm going to talk about concerns and questions you might have when you start thinking about putting big data in institutional repositories and what you might want to consider if you're thinking of starting one. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples <laughs> um, and options within like which kinds of platforms you can use for an IR. I will also call them IRs throughout this because I can't say the whole thing all the time. Um, but I'll give you uh, options for platforms and then examples within some of those platforms of what a repository could look like and how it can manage data and data sets. And then I will give you some background on DeepEnd. I know Matt just talked about it quite a bit, so I will skip part of that. <laughs> And then just give you a demo of what DeepEnd um, looks like in NSU Works and show you the front and back ends of it. So that is what I'll be going over. So what is an institutional repository? You just said you've learned about them already. But basically they um, collect, preserve, and disseminate the scholarship of an institution and also the historical materials. So that comes in handy in my job as the university archivist as we work with the archives of the university, which is the history. Uh, so we are digitizing photographs and everything and putting them in the repository as well. So it's not just uh, faculty scholarship, it's a lot of other things. So this is what NSU Works looks like. Uh, we're trying to represent every school and college that's here in this university. There are 17 of them, and we currently represent 15 of them in NSU Works. Uh, I'm working on adding the 16th right now. They're starting a journal. Well, they already have a journal, but they're going to add it to NSU Works. And the 17th one it doesn't actually exist yet. There's a new college that they're starting in 2017. Um, called the College of Allopathic Medicine. So it doesn't exist, which is why is it represented. Um, but we are trying to represent everyone. Uh, there's various features that help us show what the research is doing in NSU Works. Um, so there's that download map. You can kind of see, it's very faded, but <laughs> you can see a map of the world at the top with little pins dropping on it, which show where the downloads of research that are in the repository are happening around the world. Um, there's the, the colorful wheel at the bottom, which shows, I should use the, Thanks, so it's recorded. <laughs> uh, there's a colorful wheel at the bottom which shows like what type of scholarship. Each of the colors represents a different academic discipline. Um, so those are some of the things that we have in NSU Works uh, to show off what it's doing. As just a snapshot of what we have, there are currently um, 12,300 items in NSU Works and we average 1,500 downloads a day. And it is two, it'll be two years old in February. So it's very robust. We've been adding a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, we do actually, uh, I'll go back for one second. We, one of the things I've been uh, struggling to add as much as possible since I started is journals, faculty produced journals where they are the editors and um, re peer reviewers and everything on the journals. We currently have eight journals in NSU Works and we're looking to add two more. Those are some of the things that get the most downloads because it's peer reviewed research so it's being accessed all over the world. It's also being, they're being contributed to from researchers from all over the world. Uh, so that's really great. We also have three conferences in the repository, and we're working to add um, data sets and major data research projects. So one of the ones we have so far is DeepEnd, and then we're trying to reach out to faculty um, to get more interest in using the repository because it's a free service to all the faculty here on campus. So we are working to do outreach for that, and I'll show a thing at the end about that. Uh, so as I mentioned, institutional repositories can hold things besides data sets. So if you're thinking of, uh, you're interested in one for your institution, they can do a lot of other things besides data sets, which I know is the focus of this conference, but our training. <laughs> um, they do hold a bunch of other things. I'm going to talk about data sets today. So that was my very brief introduction to NSU Works and institutional repositories in general. And I'm going to move on to um, how you might approach uh, putting data sets in institutional repositories. 
and some of the common considerations that you might want to think about before you either get a repository or start putting things in it. So one of the big common misconceptions about uh, institutional repositories and data sets is that you're not going to be able to do it in an institutional repository because it'll take up too much space and maybe you only have a set limit of space for your repository and you can't have data sets in it because they're going to be 50 terabytes of data or something. But the reality is, is that data sets can come in all sizes. You might have one um, Excel spreadsheet, which is the entire data set for a project that's only 300 kilobytes in size. Um, then again, you might also have one that's like 100 audio files that's four terabytes in size. So they do come in a lot of different sizes. And when you're thinking <laughs> about starting a data set project at your institution, and you might be buying or looking into open source platforms for repositories, you want to decide which kind you're going to be able to um, have at your institution based on the sizes that you might run across. So it is a good thing to think about. Yes. <laughs> and I know you guys have been shopping a lot, so <laughs> you might need to go hit up some shoe stars. Uh, so this is research that was conducted in 2013, um, and it pulled from a random sampling of data sets um, from Figshare, Dryad, and Harvard's Dataverse. And it was found that the majority of individual files in a data set are less than 500 kilobytes, and only 1% of the files were over 1 gigabyte. Um, Wiley did a study a couple, no, it's like nine months ago now, where they scanned data project sizes, the whole thing, not just one file and found that 16% um, of the projects were less than 10 gigabyte and only 3.5 were more than 3 terabytes. So again, it's just a representation of what kind of sizes a data set project can entail. Another thing that you might run into um, when talking to people about data sets and repositories is that they're going to say that all of the file types that they're going to be putting in are numeric, um, but that is not true. I mean, these two examples do make it seem true. Um, these are both uh, from Bates College and Colby College, and they are both uh, CSV and Excel files. But the reality is, is the data sets can come in all sorts of files, which I'm sure you guys have talked about this week too, and I just wasn't here for those chats. So. Um, but this on the left is an example from Lawrence University, where it's the files are um, for 3D printers. So it's a file for a 3D printer, and they've uploaded those. Uh, they're for modeling viruses and proteins and you can download it and then put it in your, upload it to your own 3D printer and print it out. So that's one type of data set or data file type um, that exists. And the one on the right is audio files um, from, from Ireland. It's from Arrow at the Dublin Institute of Technology where they did an oral interview project and collected a bunch of different audio files from faculty and former staff members to capture the historical information about the school. Uh, so Clemson University, which is here in the States, ran this uh, survey in 2014, pulling their faculty about what types of file extensions they're producing in their research, what kind of data they're doing. And as you can see, most of the top ones are uh, textual. So there's PDFs and Word docs and PowerPoint and Excel. But there are some that are uh, WMV files, WAV files, so you have audio, video, image files as well. So this is, again, a key thing that you might want to think about if you're looking into data set projects and repositories that you're going to run, is what kind of platform you're going to use and whether it will be hand able to handle all sorts of file types. So you want to think about that and have it um, solutions ready for that. These are some types of repositories for data management. And there are way too many of them on the slide, I know, and I'm not going to talk about all of them in depth. Uh, so Digital Commons is the one that we use here. That's what NSU Works is based on. And it is a paid platform. So it's hosted by B Press, which is a company in Berkeley, California. And so we pay for it. They host it. They do all the updates for it. They do development of new features. So we don't have to do any of that. We just put stuff in the repository. All the other options are open source. So ePrints um, was developed at the University of Southampton. Uh, let's see, what other ones? Um, DSpace was developed at MIT. Um, Fedora, it was developed at Cornell University. These ones, you can go to the websites, you can download the platform, but then you have to do all the work of customizing it for your needs, installing it, doing updates, making sure nothing breaks. But those are options that are free, that are out there. Um, Islandora, which is another one, I'm not going to talk about a lot, <laughs> 
It merges Fedora with Drupal, which Matt mentioned. So it's a content management system. Um, and it's from the University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, Hydra is a semi-new app. It's not that new anymore. Um, but it attempts to build a um, CMS uh, content management system on top of Fedora. So a lot of them are using Fedora as a starting point and then trying to help you by building something that's easy, like more easily packaged and easier to take and just turn on all at once. So that's good. Um, and Hub Zero is the last one. Uh, it was started at Purdue University and they are expanding it rapidly to include new hubs of uh, communities of data projects. So again, I'm not going to show you examples of all of these, um, mostly because I am not that familiar with all of them. Uh, I am mostly familiar with Digital Commons, but I will show you examples from three of the other ones as well.